Films in Focus with David Sterrett is underwritten by The Movie House, your destination for first-run Hollywood and independent movies, and a digital portal to the Met Opera, National Theater Live, and special events worldwide in Millerton, New York, and on the web, themoviehouse.net. David Sterrett is the editor-in-chief of the Quarterly Review of Film and Video, contributing writer at Cineast, film professor at the Maryland Institute College of Art, and Robin Hood Radio's very own critic. We're very possessive. We're happy to have him. The film's... Amazing Grace, Three Faces, Long Day's Journey into Night, and The Brink. Hi, David. How are you? I'm doing okay. I'm doing okay. How are you? <clears throat> Not uh, e- equally okay. Equally okay. All right. Well, I'm glad that we're both doing uh, each as okay as the other. And yeah, I'd like to talk about four films this week, which is uh, quite a lot, but one of them is sort of, of a specialty item, so I, I won't say too much about that. But let's begin with Amazing Grace. Uh, this is a movie that is basically a, a concert film presenting uh, a session that, or a couple of sessions actually, it's edited from a couple of, of, of nights, uh, that Aretha Franklin did. Uh, at the New Bethel Baptist Church in Watts in Los Angeles, uh, way back in 1972. And so why is a concert film that was actually shot in 1972 just being released now? Well, uh, the idea was to make this concert film way back then, uh, and Sidney Pollack, a very major Hollywood director, was in charge of the filming of it. They did it with some 16 millimeter cameras and uh, got some terrific footage and obviously some terrific sound. Uh, But then, um, for one reason or another, Aretha Franklin did not want the movie to be released. So the movie was really never even completed. Uh, It was never finished up. It was never made into a final polished product. Many, many years later, uh, a producer named Alan Elliott got a hold of it and uh, wanted to finish it up and release it. And once again, uh, Aretha Franklin and her representatives uh, objected to this and would not allow the movie to be shown anywhere. So now the movie was finished, but it still couldn't be shown. So uh, Aretha Franklin died not too long ago. And uh, now uh, this producer, Alan Elliott, uh, and his people have uh, have released the film. So it is now in theaters sort of all over the place. And Uh, It is receiving ecstatic reviews from just about everybody. Uh, I will say it has the look of a somewhat unpolished movie. Uh, It kind of jumps around a bit and um, it's not very smoothly presented. Uh, Also, I mean, I'm about to say something. I am alone in the entire cosmos for not being totally thrilled every time I hear Aretha Franklin. You know, she's a very fine pop singer and all that. Uh, I've just never been uh, very an enthusiast for, for, for her singing. Now, one more thing I have to mention is that, as the title suggests, Amazing Grace is not pop music. It is actually uh, gospel music, uh, which was her first love, as with many African-American popular singers. It's the, the, the scene that she came out of originally. And there is just some wonderful, wonderful singing by her and by the choir that accompanies her. Uh, and uh, it's all just fine. But again, the movie looks and sounds kind of ragged at times. Uh, and it, it's not really a fully polished thing. But then again, in a way, that kind of adds to its charm. So as you may be uh, guessing, because uh, I am not an enormous admirer of Aretha Franklin, whose voice I've always found just a bit strident for my taste, uh, I certainly love good gospel music, and there is some very thumping music played in the course of this movie. Uh, I will mention one more hesitation I have about the film, which is that there's a lot of talk. Uh, it has been called a sort of a wall-to-wall music film, but it is really not that. Uh, there's a lot of introductory stuff at the beginning and there's people who sort of make little speeches along the way. I wish that it were more of a wall to wall concert film. That said, people who love Aretha Franklin, which is most people are going to love this movie. So amazing grace in that respect has a very high recommendation from me. Our next film, Three Faces, uh, is uh, Amazing Grace is obviously a documentary. Uh, Three Faces is not a documentary, but it's an interesting sort of a self-reflecting movie uh, because it's kind of a movie about movie making in a way. And it's an Iranian film, and it was made by the very major and very great Iranian director, Jafar Panahi, who emerged on the scene many, many years ago with a remarkable film called The White Balloon, and he's still very much around. Now, one of the interesting things about Jafar Panahi, one of the most interesting 
interesting things about him is that he got into a whole lot of trouble with the Iranian government uh, a number of years ago. And he is right now uh, around halfway through, I think going on halfway through a 20 year ban on making movies. Now he has still managed to make movies. Uh, and sometimes his movies are about his inability to make movies. A few years ago, for example, he made a movie which was shown in America and elsewhere. The title of it being, this is not a film. So he's not allowed to make films. So he makes a movie called, this is not a film. Uh, so he is a, obviously a very clever guy and he does manage to keep making movies and he does keep managing to get them into international release one way or another. And three faces is very much in that category. It is very much around, uh, and is, is playing, you know, in a lot of different places. Now what it is about, it is a movie about movie making and it starts out, uh, with Jafar P Panahi, uh, driving in his car, uh, with a very well-known Iranian actress playing herself, man as Jafari. And uh, the two of them are driving around and she is looking with a lot of alarm at something which has arrived on her smartphone, which is a long self-made video, a selfie video uh, made by a young woman who is saying that she is about to commit suicide. Uh, she wants to be an actress. She wants very, very badly to be an actress. That is what this young woman is saying in this selfie video that she has made. Uh, but her family won't allow her. Her village won't allow her. Everybody regards this as a, uh, a disgraceful occupation to want to go into, to merely be an entertainer. It's not moral. Nobody will allow her to go and do what she wants to do, which is go to Tehran and study uh, formally to become an actress. So because of this, she is going to kill herself. And at the end of this little video, and all this we're seeing on the smartphone at the very beginning of Panahi's movie, uh, she appears to hang herself. Uh, so it's very, very, very harrowing. So obviously Panahi playing himself and the, uh, the actress who is traveling with him, they're driving along, uh, uh, Benes Jafari, uh, playing herself are, are absolutely jolted by this. Obviously they are totally shocked. They are horrified by this. Uh, and, uh, this young woman who has pleaded for their help. And yet apparently they didn't even get this video until after the young woman in the video has killed herself. So they want to find out what's going on here. Now the actress, Benaz Jafari is supposed to be shooting a film right now and she's kind of walked away from the production because she's been so horrified by getting this video. So she and uh, Jafar Panahi uh, now want to figure out what really happened. D is this thing real, first of all? Maybe it's a hoax. Maybe it's some sort of a put on. Uh, the, the, or uh, more horrifyingly, maybe it's real. So they, they are in their car and they are traveling to where they believe this young woman may have killed herself and find her village, maybe find her family, find her friends and find out if she's still alive, whether this whole thing was, was, was real or not, whether it actually resulted in a suicide. So this is what the movie is about. It's called Three Faces because basically it's about three different actresses at different stages in, in their careers. There's another figure who arrives later in the film uh, who is a very, very old elderly actress who was making movies, even starring in movies, even before Panahi was a movie maker. And she now kind of lives on the very fringes of her community, regarded as not very respectably because she was an actress, even though she was a very major and important actress. So uh, this movie has a lot to do with performance. It has a lot to do with uh, certainly Iranian mores and with the, the whole, the, the kind of strictures that there are uh, on Iranian cinema uh, because of all kinds of government controls and censorship and, and mores and folkways and things like that. So all of these things figure into Three Faces, which is also very much a suspense movie. Uh, as uh, Jafari and Panahi travel about uh, trying to find out more and more things. They, they, they're, they're way out in the countryside. They meet a whole lot of very rural people uh, and they have interesting conversations with these people and they find out all kinds of different attitudes toward them as being people involved in the filmmaking industry. They're regarded as mere entertainers, even though Jafari is very much a maker of art films. Uh, so anyway, that, that is really, all of these different things are what Three Faces, about, Faces is about. Many Iranian filmmakers have faced a lot of trouble uh, from the Iranian government over the years. Uh, one early solution to this, uh, back around in the 80s and 90s when Iranian cinema was emerging as a really major force in world cinema, uh, a lot of the filmmakers uh, who were around at that time made movies that focused on children because it was a way of not having the government be scrutinizing them so closely and they could deal with human issues without getting into sort of political waters. That said, a lot of times they still got into trouble uh, for socio-political reasons. Uh, 
but now uh, the, the, the scene has broadened out a lot. There's a much wider range of subject matter in today's Iranian cinema, but still an enormous amount of very great work is being done. Uh, possibly the greatest of all the Iranian cinemas, who died just a few years ago, unfortunately, was a guy named Abbas Karastami, uh, a, a profoundly great figure in, in, in world cinema generally and a, a towering titan in, uh, in, in Iranian cinema. And Three Faces, the new Jafir Panahi movie, seems to have a lot of influence uh, from Karastami. Karastami, for example, loved to film people in cars because it was a way of filming people having conversations where they were very close to each other, but they could open up more because they weren't actually facing each other. Also, you could have the landscape going on outside the car. There's a lot of that that goes on in Three Faces, I think, a lot of influence from Panahi. You get to see a lot of the Iranian countryside in this film, as well as seeing just some terrific acting. And again, a very absorbing, suspenseful story. So Three Faces is a very dramatic film, a very socially and politically meaningful film, and just a beautifully acted film. Uh, I, I recommend it very, very highly. It's not the greatest film ever to come out of, of Iran, but it's a very, very fine piece of work. I said before I've got a sort of a specialty item I want to touch on today, and I'll do it briefly. Long Day's Journey into Night, which is directed by a fairly new Chinese filmmaker named Gan Bi. Actually, Be Gone is the way that it appears in the credits of his films. He made a movie a few years ago, his, his first feature, a movie called Kylie Blues, which is very, very dreamlike and meandering, and I found it absolutely riveting. Well, now he has made a follow-up to that, which also takes place uh, in this Chinese region called Kylie, called Long Day's Journey Into Night. It has nothing whatever to do with the great Eugene O'Neill play of that title. Uh, it's a man who goes back to uh, the place where he's from, uh, in this region called Kylie, and uh, he runs across a woman who uh, is a sort of a mysterious figure in a lot of ways, and she reminds him very closely of a woman who he knew a long time ago. Could it possibly be the same woman, or is it really a completely different woman? And as he tries to explore who this new woman is and put this together with his memories of this woman he knew years ago, the movie alternates and flows very freely among memory and dream and present experience, and they all intermingle until they're practically inseparable from each other. It's an absolutely haunting, very dreamlike and beautiful, darkly beautiful film. And what's most unusual about it is that it's about two and a half hours long, a little less than that. And the last hour is in 3D. So around, uh, around somewhere around an hour before the end of the movie, the main character puts on his 3D glasses and we all put on our 3D glasses and you see it in 3D and it becomes even more haunting and beautiful. Beautiful then. So if you have an opportunity to see this film, especially with that hour in 3D, I totally recommend it. Bygan's wonderful movie, Long Day's Journey Into Night. The last film I want to touch on today is, as our first film, Amazing Grace, is a documentary called The Brink made by Alison Clayman. It is so different from the, uh, the Aretha Franklin documentary, Amazing Grace. The Brink is a much more conventionally made documentary, and it is about Stephen K. Bannon, that famous figure from the Donald Trump uh, administration. Of course, he's no longer there. Uh, he got booted out quite a while ago. And Bannon is just one of the most interesting figures, and to my way of thinking, one of the most reprehensible figures in today's kind of international political scene. And I say international because uh, he has been, since leaving the Trump administration, he has been devoting a lot of his attention to Europe. And what is he is, of course, is an exponent of, uh, of, of nationalism, extreme nationalism, uh, nationalism of all kinds, economic nationalism, social nationalism, political nationalism. And he goes around preaching this gospel. He seems to me, and of course, many people may disagree with this, to be a figure who is mainly interested in power, the different groups that he really loves his particular religious groups, his particular social groups, his particular political groups, uh, all of these groups, he is for them having as much power as they can have. And what he does is to go around kind of spreading this gospel. Uh, he is an extreme right winger in all kinds of ways. And, but he is also maybe paradoxically a, a globalist in that he is 
is trying to promote the idea of nationalism in countries all over the world, especially, of course, in Europe. And during his time in the Trump administration, he was very, very much um, uh, pushing that. Now, uh, the movie The Brink by Alison Clayman is a documentary which is totally about Bannon. And it comes under the school of documentary, which I call the give him enough rope school. Uh, the movie just interviews Bannon. It gives him all this time on the screen. It lets him talk and talk and say all these different things. And to my way of thinking, he gets enough rope to hang himself. You listen to this guy for the hour and a half of this movie. And by the end of it, you think, yep, his views are just as reprehensible as I always thought they were. And by gosh, there they are on the screen. And now other people can see this as well. Of course, a lot of people will see this movie and can come out believing that Bannon is a, a very great figure, a world historical figure, perhaps. Anyway, it does what good documentaries do. Uh, it very straightforwardly presents its subject. It allows us to make up our own minds about him. And certainly Stephen K. Bannon in his own bizarre way is an interesting screen figure. And I had a good time, a thoughtful time, and in some ways a kind of agitated time watching him for about an hour and a half in this movie. So if you're interested in political documentary, if you're interested in politics at all, definitely try to see The Brink. It's very, very illuminating film. So that is my partly documentary story this week, Joe. For which we thank you, David Sterrett, Films in Focus, the films Amazing Grace, Three Faces, Long Day's Journey into Night, and The Brink. 